Good afternoon. We're going to wait for one or two more minutes um, to give everyone the opportunity to join, but we're then going to start like maximum one or two minutes late. Okay, so I would propose we get started. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to warmly welcome you in the name of the Comprehensive Cancer Center in Zurich to our third Zurich Brain Metastasis Symposium. I warmly welcome you in the name of Michael Weller and myself, Matthias Guggenberger, who are organizing this symposium. It's the third symposium, and um, obviously after the second one, we had a discussion, is there a need for a third one? You shouldn't just continue because it's tradition, but as you are all aware, there has been tremendously fast developments in the field of brain metastasis, in the field of diagnostic, but also in the field of treatment. So I think it's worthwhile um, for this third symposium. And that is what you will also see in our program that we put together a highly interdisciplinary, highly interprofessional um, symposium covering all aspects of diagnosis, treatment, local and systemic treatment of brain metastasis. So without further ado, but um, I would like to get started. But before we get started, many thanks to our industry partners for kindly supporting our symposium. Without them, this wouldn't have been possible. So I would like now to introduce the first speaker, who I guess every one of you knows, Emily Leroun, Associate Professor and Senior Clinician here at the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery. You can already sense her strong interdisciplinary um, activities. She's a researcher in particular in the field of brain metastasis, leptomeningeal disease, has done original research and has recently published as first author the EANO and ESMO guidelines on treatment of brain metastasis. And that's what you will show us today, the development and the results of this guideline. Emily, thanks for joining and the floor is yours. I hope you can see the slides now. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, for the very kind introduction. So uh, I'm happy to, to present uh, recent ENO ESMO guidelines for brain metastasis. So that's a venture between the European Association of New Oncology and the European Society of Medical Oncology. This is my disclosure slide. Uh, to, to start, just a big background on the level of evidence for the classification. So this is the IANO part, so more the neurological part. So we have um, level of evidence for diagnosis, diagnostic measure, and therapeutic intervention. And for when you go for class one for both, that's good. We have uh, um, very good study and strong uh, support for what we say. For class four, you see it's more um, sometimes expert opinion or very small studies. And for rating our recommendation, level A is established as uh, useful uh, for 
predictive or use, not useful for prediction, and level, level C is not, um, not really good. If we look now at the ESMO um, level of evidence and grade of recommendations, that's a bit different. So for level of evidence for class one, it's also good with a good, a strong support of what we say. And the grade of recommendation level A is that strong evidence for efficacy. And level E, it's strong evidence against efficacy. So it's a bit different, so <laughs> it's uh, challenging. But um, to, to start, so just a bit of background of brain metastasis, that's a very frequent problem in our life with patients, with uh, cancer patients. So this was published already a few years ago. This has been updated uh, recently, but the numbers have not changed so much. So that's a big cohort um, in the US. So if you look uh, amongst the um, entire cohort with patient, in patients um, um, diagnosed uh, with brain metastasis at the time of cancer diagnosis, we have quite some patients, especially with lung cancer, who have uh, already brain metastasis. And if you look at the subset of patients with metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis of the cancer, here we can see that we have quite a lot of melanoma, lung uh, cancer especially. So this is um, guidelines that are accessible online now. So with the team and also Matthias uh, Kuckenberger, second author. So that's nice to work together. So first, regarding the diagnosis uh, of brain metastasis, uh, we think and that's something a bit new that the screening for brain metastasis should be considered for patients with lung cancer. Maybe with the exception of stage one non-small cell lung cancer should also be done for stage four melanoma. We have seen that's quite frequent in melanoma patients who have metastatic disease at diagnosis, and also probably for patients with metastatic R2 positive and triple negative breast cancer. So, and of course, the diagnosis workup of patients with suspected brain metastasis should include um, uh, crinal MRI. Also regarding uh, the diagnosis, so in fact, if a patient had the opportunity to get a surgical resection, um, we should look again at the um, treatment relevant predictive biomarkers that were detected in the primary tumor or extra CNS metastasis because sometimes it can, it can change in brain metastasis and this has to be updated if possible if a surgery is planned. Uh, this is a um, decision tree that was provided by the, our uh, pathology colleagues for patients with brain metastasis from an unknown primary cancer. This is an algorithm, and normally all institutions should have a, a, an algorithm like this one, or otherwise this one can help. And at least for the diagnosis, we thought that cell-free DNA in the blood analysis should not be routinely uh, performed. In fact, for the characterization or monitoring of brain metastasis at the moment, it would be great to have this data, but at the moment it's still more in development and research. And also CSF study should be carried out only um, when um, leptomenangial metastasis is suspected. What about treatment? So that's always a big question, local versus whole brain versus systemic treatment for brain metastasis. So what should we do? To start with surgery, so there are a lot of new uh, innovative tools that are available now. So regarding surgery, of course, it has to be uh, proposed to the patient when the nature of the tumor is not really certain, we are, we are not sure that's a, a brain metastasis or even a tumor. When we have no primary tumor, when um, more than one tumor is known to know which one has given the brain metastasis, or when the primary tumor rarely generates brain metastasis, 
or also when we need to update the molecular profile because it will impact the clinical decision making. In general, single brain metastasis should also be considered for surgical resection. And it's also important to think of surgery for patients that require steroids, especially for patients who are candidates for immune checkpoint inhibition. What about radiotherapy now? So regarding radiotherapy, uh, stereotactic radiotherapy is uh, recommended for patients with a limited number of uh, brain metastases. So it's uh, one to four. It may be considered for patients with a higher uh, number of brain metastases if the volume is less than 15 milliliter. It clearly says that um, postoperative wall brain radiotherapy after neurosurgical resection or after SRS should be avoided. So that's the, also a clear st statement in our guidelines. And that supportive care with omission of wall brain radiotherapy should be considered in, in patients with multiple brain metastases that are not eligible to SRS and who have a poor performance status. Regarding systemic treatment, so systemic pharmacotherapy should be based on the primary tumor type and previous treatment um, already received by the patient. So then we have some specific recommendation for breast cancer um, and also for lung cancer and melanoma. I think maybe what, what was a bit more new for melanoma, it's that uh, combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab without or with SRS should be the prefer uh, first line treatment option, not only in BRAF wild type, but also in BRAF mutated asymptomatic patients. So this is um, something interesting. And here you have all this um, discussion of the treatment. So what should we do first? And I think that will be um, discussed also tomorrow, what is the best sequence to, for, the, for the patient? Should, should we combine immediately SRS and systemic treatment or keep SRS at progression? This is really a big question. And I think that yeah, randomized trials are really needed. And now, how can we fuse all these approaches? So clearly, we have a lot of options for our patients and we need to individualize the treatment for each patient, taking into consideration the different contribution of surgery, radiation oncology, and medical oncology. Ideally, the decision should be discussed at a dedicated uh, brain metastasis board, that's uh, ideal, or at least at a disease-specific tumor board with participations of colleagues that are, who are experienced in the management of uh, CNS tumors. And of course, we need to have this randomized trial in patients with asymptomatic or oligosymptomatic brain metastasis to identify the optimal combined modality treatment of systemic therapy uh, with surgery or SRS. And so this is the um, decision tree that we have proposed in general, so more for non-small cell lung cancer and breast um, cancer patients with brain metastasis. So if you have a suspicion of brain metastasis, you are not really sure that the brain metastasis, you have to confirm your diagnosis by biopsy or resection. Otherwise, most of the time you have a patient with a known um, histology confirmed cancer and a typical finding on MRI. So you have your diagnosis. For patients who have a favorable prognostic factor, which means one to 10 brain metastasis, controlled extra CNS disease, good performance status, and expected survival of more than three months, you have the option of surgery followed by stereotactic um, uh, therapy. Um, stereotactic radiotherapy alone, surgery followed by systemic pharmacotherapy or systemic therapy. And this was a lot of discussion among the group because we clearly, we have no very strong data and clearly we really need this randomized trial. For patients with unfavorable prognostic factor, 
we propose systemic pharmacotherapy or whole brain radiotherapy. I've seen that whole brain is not here for patients with favorable uh, prognostic factor. And of course, for patients who have uh, poor um, expected survival, we have to think of palliative care. So regarding the monitoring and follow-up, so we have to follow up the patients uh, regularly every two to three months. And of course, earlier, if in case of uh, suspicion of progression, if there are uh, clinical deterioration, it would be also nice to sometimes to look at the neurocognitive function and ability to consent, in fact, to treatment, because with these brain tumor patients, it can be a problem. And also to perform this brain MRI every two to two, three months. We have some challenges in the response assistance, some clinical challenges. So, because sometimes patients can deteriorate um, and it's related to a toxicity, committant complication. Um, steroids can also make the response a bit difficult. Uh, regarding imaging challenging, I think that uh, Andrea Bing will, will give us some um, recommendation hopefully in the next talk. So I will <laughs> let her discuss that. Regarding the supportive care, of course, steroids always in symptomatic patient only. So it's not a prophylactic treatment. If patients need steroids uh, for, because of clinical um, deterioration, we have to, to help him, but um, only, only in this situation. Um, no primary anticonvulsant prophylaxis, so only when you have a um, seizure. Uh, and what is important also to think on the competency to drive. And for this, we have to take into consideration epilepsy, cognitive function, and other neurological function. And we need to adhere to national guidelines in law, of course. So in conclusion, in these guidelines, I think the role of systemic treatment and immunotherapy has increased. And, but we still have really to to, to determine the best um, option, the best combination option, and the best timing of uh, radiotherapy and systemic therapy. And also, I think we still need to, to improve our uh, criteria for response, of, response assessment. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, Emily, for this excellent overview, which is not easy in such a short time. Um, I see that people are already using the chat functionality. So if you have asked questions, please use the chat and um, then we can forward to the speakers. One question was, um, where does the limitation to less than 15 cubic centimeter come from? And is that only referring to single fraction or hyperfractionated treatment? This is for single fraction. But the second question may be to you, Emily, the question, to my knowledge, dedicated brain metastasis tumor boards are not really established in many cancer centers in Germany, but maybe also in other countries. How is that handled in Switzerland? And what is your recommendation to really achieve this interdis interdisciplinary kind of decision-making process and also keep us active having already 20 or 25 tumor boards with, which we have to attend? Yes, I, I think, of course, the best is to have, would be to have a brain metastasis dedicated tumor board. I think that would be an option regarding the number of brain metastasis patients. So, and that's also a nice opportunity to, to discuss with colleagues and to, yeah, to get the best decision for, for the patient. Probably it's, yeah, it's maybe difficult because of the number of, of uh, tumor board, as you said, Matthias, that are already existing. So at least I think if you have brain metastasis in a patient, it's nice if you have uh, your surgeon there, um, probably radiotherapist, of course, and probably neurologist as well, to discuss, in fact, the different therapeutic options because um, it's difficult to feel that is moving quite quickly and to, to be really updated on the last publication. That's, that's also challenging. So I think we have to learn from each other and to improve the decision for the patient. Okay, um, I can see some more questions popping into the chat. Um, one is um, 
kind of listing some indications um, which are presented at this specific center um, to a tumor board. And as we can see, it, it is the challenging cases. And this is also somehow reflecting our practice patients, which are quite obvious and clear. They are decided in the kind of organ tumor board. But if there's no histology being available, if we are kind of um, lacking systemic or local treatment options, if there's borderline between um, surgery and radiation oncology, they are moved to the neuro-oncology board. Another question which is um, being here is, um, do you have um, a weekly tumor board or how do you organize it to just keep in time? Many patients with brain metastasis are being symptomatic. So if that would be a weekly board only, it might be too late. So you present it in lung first and then you wait for a week. How do you address this issue? Yes, so that's a good question. I think ideally it should be presented the same week when we have the diagnosis. So um, maybe for brain metastasis, we already, most of the time we have the histological diagnosis. So we, at least we don't need to wait for that. And I think it's, if we can wait a few days for the patient and get better quality for the next treatment, I think it's fine. Maybe if you, of course, if you think that's an emergency, you have to call your neurosurgeon probably. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, maybe if you think that could be a, an indication for radiotherapy, you can already contact your radiotherapist like that. Maybe you can already plan something and confirm at the next tumor board to avoid to too, too much delay. Um, another question, um, because we still have some time. Um, the last um, EANO and ESMO guideline brain metastasis was from 2017, if, if I remember correctly. So this was updated now after four years. Um, when you look back, where do you think, have you seen the kind of most um, dramatic improvement and advancement? And where would you say we are truly lacking behind in terms of evidence generation? If you just summarize the current guideline, put it into perspective with the last one from 17. I think in these guidelines, we have more systemic treatment and the challenge is to discuss the combination of systemic treatment and radiation therapy. I think for neurosurgery, it's not really uh, questionable because when you can do it, you have the opportunity, you should always think of that. Um, I think what is new, so we have clearly mentioned that raw brain radiotherapy should really be avoided, especially in patients uh, with uh, good prognostic. And so maybe what we have to improve in the future, it's more for the follow-up um, of the patient, we have to develop liquid biopsy imaging and um, continue to improve the yeah, the different also radiotherapy option and your surgery option. Yeah. Okay, maybe the last question is about radiation. Um, whole brain radiation with hippocampus bearing simultaneous integrated boost. What is your opinion on this new um, kind of radiation techniques for whole brain? Um, so the benefit of whole brain has not really been demonstrated, especially for patients. So um, for patient with poor prognosis. So here's more the question, if you do um, sparing hippocampal, um, that's more for patients with a good prognosis normally because it takes time, I think, to, to plan that. <laughs> Maybe you can comment more than me on, on, on this topic. So I, for me, I would say that for really for patients with good prognostic, I would prefer to have stereotactic radiotherapy if you have a patient and you cannot do stereotactic radiotherapy for one or the other reason, and the pronostic is not too bad, yes, you can discuss this, but I'm also not sure that this has really been proven to be efficient to avoid um, cognitive complication in the future in late, uh, in the, yeah, late complication, yeah. That is why it has been mentioned, if I, if I remember correctly, but we have not made a, made a strong emphasis. Also thinking about the PCI, at the time when we were writing the, the guideline, and um, we had one negative trial for PCI, and now we have a positive one. So it's still kind of, I would say, controversial, the true value of hippocampus bearing. 
Okay, um, if there's no further questions, Emily, many, many thanks for this excellent presentation, also the um, long discussion. And with that, I would like to hand over to Mike. Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Um, also a warm welcome from my side. Thank you also specifically to Matthias for his major contributions to the guideline. I think during the guideline preparation, we have also learned a lot, right? At least we know where we disagree. So I think these guideline processes are really very, very helpful. And I'm sure the next ones will be much better than the ones from certainly from 2017. So um, one topic that I think has not been covered in too much depth in the guidelines is imaging. And I think um, we all agree that uh, imaging is notoriously important and difficult um, in this field with a lot of buzzwords like pseudoprogression, necrosis, upscopal effects. So a lot of challenges in the interpretation of imaging. And I hope that um, Andrea Bing, a good friend and colleague from the neighboring department, will enlighten us a little bit regarding some of these issues. And please uh, remember, we are non-neuroradiologists. You have to explain your sequences, otherwise we will be lost. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you so much for the kind introduction words, and I um, will uh, do my best to um, show you all about the sequences um, um, so that there will be no question open. So again, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So as Emily has shown, um, metastases play a major role in brain tumors. They can make up to 50% of brain tumors. So as you know, different brain tumors can have a different look or can, they can look quite alike. So this is also a daily challenge to a new radiologist. I would like to begin with some facts, um, although I guess all of you know them, but I find it quite good to remember. So metastases are, of course, more often present in adults than in children. That's uh, most common setting as neopresence in adults. And brain metastases appear in 50% of cases, cancer patients. Details have been shown by Emily. And 10% of the origins are known when the primary diagnosis is made by MRI. In adults, we have seen lung, breast cancer, melanoma, real is carcinoma and colon carcinoma as the um, um, most um, common um, cancer sites. So we know that there are different routes for spreading. Most common is of course the extracranial primary to the CNS via blood, via direct geographic extensions possible. Perineural perivascular spread is also common, less common and this is not the topic of this talk a brain to brain or brain to CSF from primary brain tumor. So in adults, we have, of course, um, an 80% metastasis in the brain. And there, as you might have um, seen uh, more, the cerebral hemispheres are more, much more often involved than the cerebellum. We have 15% involvement of the dura and skull and um, in 5% peel, so to speak, lab meningeal and CSF involvement. As I will show you, you can have microscopic or a few centimeter um, measured metastases. In the, the skull and dura, these metastases are quite variable. And these are the numbers, it's good to remember. When we look at an MRI or CT scan, how often will a solitary lesion be seen there in 50%, two lesions in 20%, up to three lesions in 30%, and only 5% have more than five lesions. So from the gross pathology, we know that they are more, most often round and well circumscribed and not so much um, uh, infiltrating. They have variable edema, necrosis, and hemorrhage. And this is something that is important for all of us. Of course, the metastasis has preserved the general features of the primary tumor, which might be interesting for further uh, research, of course, it is interesting for further research. Uh, this would be the only images from CT because I would like to address that most patients come to us 
with uh, um, with primary CT scan as an emergency, like in this patient with a melanoma and a big space occupying effect and involvement of the midline um, with midline deviation. Um, just to warm up any more, uh, much a little bit more, um, here you can see a brain metastasis in the um, tectum, uh, which has um, occupied uh, over the uh, follow up of one year the uh, aqueducal and has then had um, um, with the first with a branch and then with a um, with a um, um, neurosurgery intervention of the um, uh, uh, third ventricle to open the uh, space there. Another patient with brain metastasis uh, of the as breast primary cancer, which different appearances. Uh, melanoma not uh, should also be mentioned here. Want to address the point that melanoma has often blood uh, inside, blood level like here, or it can be big. It can be very, very small, and you can guess when there are so many that's easy, but when there are only one of it, it can be quite challenging for the new radiologist. And therefore, we often go through the images much more than one time in each patient. The colon and um, uh, metastasis are shown here typically, edema, um, you have a T1, a T2 post contrast, and a flare, and I will come to that later. I would like to say that metastasis can imitate. Um, primary brain tumors, like here, the melanoma uh, metastases, which imitated a glioblastoma. So what we do, and this is what um, Professor Weller asked for, we do, of course, special protocols. We have special protocols for brain tumors, and <clears throat> which is shown here by Alexen, and uh, also an images here, uh, an image from the glioblastoma, here with measurement of Rano as an example. But for the sake of this talk, we have, of course, protocols that address primarily brain metastases. And this is um, a paper by Kaufman, and they proposed um, uh, an optimal MR protocol at three Tesla. They have also not so optimal, but I would like to address the optimal protocol in this talk here at three Tesla. Of course, brain metastases can be scanned at 1.5 Tesla, that's no doubt. But you have to need to have a, a good protocol. And this protocol includes a 3D T1 pre and post contrast, a 2D flare, um, di um, diffusion weighted imaging, and T2, T, T, uh, uh, 2D T2 weighted imaging, and optionally a perfusion. We do all of that, and also we do optionally a perfusion. But the, what we do in our institution, we use a 3D flare and not a 2D flare. So these are the standard sequences we use, as you have seen from the names, I've written them up, uh, uh, at the head of each sequence, flare, T1, T1 post contrast, T2, and this patient you've seen before, uh, diffusion weighted and the apparent diffusion coefficient map and SWI. Of course, in the 3D images like flare and, um, uh, and um, T1 and T1 post contrast, we also have a look at the coronal and surgical reconstructions of these sequences. So when you have the um, so-called conventional MRI sequences, as I have shown you, these conventional MRI sequences, um, i.e. Uh, the post-contrast uh, sequences is sequence as the workhorse for the RANO assessment. So in uh, 2010, um, there was a paper that defined this newly. We, um, we have measurable lesions at least 10 millimeters, with at least two slices, uh, smaller uh, um, at least um, um, five millimeter in, in thickness, non measurable lesions smaller than 10 millimeters, um, unclear margins or one dimension measurable, um, and also a non enhancing mass like T1 signal. Uh, T2's flare signal change was included then as a non measurable lesion. But if you have all these images, then you know you can't differentiate between tumor extent or progression on the one hand on, or on treatment related effects like pseudo progression, pseudo response, or radiation necrosis. You have just an image that shows you contrast or not, to, or, or not contrast and shows you a little bit more contrast or a little bit less contrast. But this is not. Um, 
but it's not all about um, what we are doing each day. So pseudo response, of course, is not addressed in this talk because it belongs to gliomas and Eva Tsutsima. So, what, um, so to start with, we, I would like to address radiant necrosis. Radiation has an impact, this impact we want to have on, on our tumors, and there's early, there are early changes and there are late changes. So it's a very complex um, biological entity, which a lot of vascular um, 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 and glial cell damage, increase in blood-brain barrier permeability, like shown in this um, little drawing, re uh, release of pro-inflammatory mediators, overexpression of vascular and utility growth factor, et cetera, et cetera. And also this um, enhances the inflammatory cell response, vascular damage and cell ap cellular apoptosis. And this is leading to vessel wall death and death of glial stem progenitors and also uh, to demyelinization. Um, to remember, radio necrosis occurs um, six months to several years post treatment. This several years is often forgotten. And this is the reason why we always look at the exact um, history of each patient to get really a good idea of what has happened from the first image of the patient, from the first symptoms of the patient to, um, um, to the newest image. These images in neuroradiology can be um, reported without this history. Often, um, this to several years in, uh, after treatment, they appear often progresses without treatment and has not been associated with better prognosis. So we are dealing with a late um, um, reaction to radiotherapy first. So um, from the radiological point of view, um, um, iranian necrosis refers to necrotic degradation of brain tissue following intracranial or regional radiation. Um, and this is, of course, a dilemma because, as you all know, radiation necrosis is totally different to tumor growth, and this needs to have totally different um, therapy management. So, how often um, does radiation necrosis appear? I have um, I would like to show you, although I'm not a radiation oncologist, I had I have I had an, a look here because I really wanted to know from the radiation oncologist how often they find it. And 16% in whole brain um, uh, radiotherapy of metastatic melanoma. And in the newer um, uh, stereotactic radiation surgery with linear accelerated, like LINAC, it was found from none to about 6%. So in the early times when we had only these conventional images, um, there was um, um, really um, a little bit, yeah, we found it quite annoying that we could not help. And um, this, is, this is, might be the reasons for the next two papers I want to just shortly mention um, that um, things happened like uh, 2008 uh, tumor was seen here. Um, uh, and, um, and then they also found that um, when you have, uh, they make the um, um, di um, division between the T2 nodule size and the total enhancing nodule, and this uh, lesion percent of it should be uh, or six or greater was recurrent tumor, or if it was less, like in this example, um, it uh, could be radiation necrosis, but they found it only in five of, of uh, in four of the five um, uh, radiation necrosis histologically proved uh, cases. So it's no wonder that this might uh, is not have is not uh, um, hold and it's not was not confirmed. And um, another temp was the T2 uh, T1 T2 matching different rate tumor growth. Like in this case, it was a recurrence where the T1 post contrast image uh, borders of the tumor were like the borders of the T2. Um, flare T2 signal. Um, so in this and in the other case, when it was a radio necrosis, these borders were not um, overlapping uh, correctly. So they also thought it could be a good sign for that. But um, I think the way we have gone, I will show you from this to further diagnostics um, was uh, quite obvious. Um, and we have, of course, other possibilities to examine the brain. And one of the most important examination methods is, of course, diffusion imaging. 
Um, in diffusion imaging, we have um, dynamic susceptibility contrast. And as one fusion modality, I will show you a second. And uh, there's also a theory spin labeling. But uh, I will focus on dynamic susceptibility contrast and dynamic contrast enhanced perfusion. Um, by co giving contrast uh, um, medium, um, then um, the dynamic susceptibility um, goes down, the relic station T2 star time decreases. And uh, then uh, from these curves, there will be um, uh, calculated the area under the curve, and then we get these nice colored maps which show the RCVV, the regional cerebral blood volume. So, from um, the literature, um, uh, um, um, meta analysis by Patel et al. showed that RCVV ratios for tumor recurrence were between 1.5, 1.5 to 3, with a pooled sensitivity of RCVV uh, um, 88% and specificity of 93%. In general, we have values that um, the RCVV uh, over three favors tumor progression over treatment related changes. And also another um, other meta-analysis demonstrated a high accuracy over 90% uh, delineating tumor recurrence from radiation necrosis. Mm, I'm a little bit um, not so yeah, happy as you may call it, because um, of course we, have, we, we use this method every day, um, but uh, we should be, uh, um, um, uh, we should think of its uh, boundaries. And of course, one boundary is that we cannot compare from institution to institution, not uh, taking into account any international um, um, comparisons, um, because um, there's a um, the cutoff for differentiating tumor from non tumor related changes. There's no international consensus about that. But um, uh, so far we use this and uh, some images that show a recurrence um, in, with the RCVV of 2.6 and a radiation necrosis, as you've seen before, with an RCVV of 1. Another method is MR spectroscopy. MR spectroscopy is highly dependent on the experience each institution has. And you need a lot of experience with spectroscopy. Um, and then it can be a very good tool to help uh, together with other imaging modalities to find a diagnosis. So recurrent brain neoplasms show elevation in choline due to an increase of cell membrane turnover which bioconcolin is a biomarker for cell membrane turnover. Features of radiation necrosis are variable decrease of NIA, like shown here, and lack of pronounced choline elevation. Normally, you have a choline peak here, much higher, and the presence of lipid lactate peaks, shown here. So this is used, and I would like to show you another example. This is the spectrum, single voxel spectroscopy, in this case, from, from the normal side. And this is a spectroscopy from the ill side. So um, we find lower choline to NIA ratios and choline to creatine ratios. Creatine, the energy supplier of the brain um, in regions of tumor necrosis as compared to recurrence. And we can find complete absence of NIA and choline peaks um, or serial scans with decreasing NIA, choline peaks, and increasing lactate peaks indicate, as shown here, radionecrosis at the peak of 1.3 ppm um, with a lactate and lipid peak. There are new kits uh, for Y on the block, like uh, MR chemical exchange saturation transfer. Um, I would like to show one or uh, explain one uh, of these um, CEST imaging methods to you. Um, uh, I mean, proton, uh, um, where protons and macromolecules absorb energy from the uh, radio frequency impulse, and these energy um, um, are, is, are this uh, um, um, frequency of this energy is a few. Um, hertz from 100 to 1,000 so, uh, hertz distant from the water of absorption frequency. Um, this energy goes to this soluble protein, protons and has 
or a direct interaction between the whole water pool of, and our body. And the energy is transferred to water and reduces the signal of water which we uh, get in the MRI. And the higher the signal loss, so to speak, then the higher protein and the higher interaction is possible and therefore can be um, um, taken to examine our tumor tissue because there's a lot of protein in there. Um, newer studies showed, shown here, they have um, examined different um, um, test image methods and found um, in one, two of them possible um, differentiation between tumor and necrosis and in one not. And I would like to make at this point a little bit advertisement of our um, um, advanced clinical imaging that we will hold uh, next uh, Tuesday. And there we will be talk about CEST imaging. We have um, new things that by texture analysis and uh, machine learning. And in this paper from uh, 2015, the authors had as a texture analyst first analyzed um, the metastasis first analyzed with the texture analysis, where um, you can um, say that an image is put into numbers so that we are leaving um, the, uh, the level where our image can see things going on. But with texture, we can see beyond. And this is expressed in, in this little images here um, and, and, um, and over there. And they found after the analysis of, of the texture, special features that are uh, kind of um, performed well and put them into a classifier. And then they got quite nice results here. So these are the beginning of texture analysis and differentiation between metastasis and gradient necrosis. Of course, everyone is waiting for a method that um, I, I'm also waiting for um, the PET. So as I'm not a, new, a nuclear medicine um, doctor, I will not go into the details of how PET from um, functions by itself, but I will show you impressive images. In this, uh, in this uh, paper, um, there's a radiant necrosis of suspected in patient with non smooth cell lung cancer. Um, and you can see that the PET behaves like um, a little bit like them are, but it's showing, of course, that there is after the suspicion of recurrence, um, a loss of um, metabolic activity. Various, you can see it a little bit change of contrast enhancement in the MRI, but um, not so much. So, in a very uh, recent and important, in a very important paper, um, um, uh, authors showed that. And there are differences um, from the uh, uptake of the metabolites uh, of the, of the uh, um, um, metabolic activities in radiation necrosis, like shown here, and recurrent. So in radiation necrosis, the metabolic activities increases, increases, and increases, whereas in recurrence, there is um, steep um, slope and then it stays on a level. And this was the first um, diagnosis of a metastasis. Also, the combination of FET-PET and MRI in this patient was, um, uh, shows recurrence. Um, um, we have the suspicion, we had this, there was a suspicion of a recurrence from the T1 post contrast image and flare images with increasing um, with the, uh, edema, and also um, in concordance, the um, metabolic activity in fat pet. Whereas on the other side, a patient with a also um, not so nice looking tumor in the centrum zinnobale, it was a little bit lower um, also, and um, with the edema. And when you look at, uh, and you might remember the things from the beginning where, a conventional MRI try to show, uh, try to find possibilities to to differentiate it. This is very difficult, and this is um, contradictory to what we see here because we see now that uh, the fat pet shows no activity, and this was historically proven a necrosis. I would like to go on with pseudo progression. So pseudo progression is from the timeline before 
radian impulse, most commonly within the first three to six months following radiotherapy. And it often spontaneously resolves and potentially indicates higher treatment efficacy if it's present. So radiologically, pseudoprogression is a new or enlarging area of contrast enhancement occurring only after the end of radiotherapy in absence of true tumor growth, which subsists or stabilizes without change in therapy. From these images, you can see in a, in a publication where melanoma uh, metastases were examined that um, there is a growth, but this growth is not due to tumor cells, but to lymphocytes, macrophages, et cetera. I um, had also looked at um, volumetric um, um, at the assessment how after stereotactic therapy metastases um, diminish, which is not very really surprising, but I found it interesting to see how different sizes of metastases behave and much more interesting concerning the pseudoprogression because I found the pseudoprogression curve uh, where we want to see it, but I found the second one. So this is really the question, was it pseudoprogression? Uh, we must believe. So it can be also a little bit later. Seemingly. From the imaging, we see a pretreatment uh, image where dura metastasis from a melanoma is present. And one month, two months, up to 12 months of treatment, we see that this um, pseudo progression diminishes. Um, there's another MR uh, possibility in perfusion imaging, as I mentioned before, that is called dynamic contrast enhanced perfusion imaging. It's less frequently used. Um, in uh, uh, for, for brain tumors, but it can be of help, as I will show you. Quantitative parameters are different. Um, there is a volumetric transfer constant, um, the exchange rate between different um, different spaces, like shown here, uh, uh, between the plasma volume and um, and the volume fraction of the extra cellular extra uh, space, um, and um, it's also superior when hemorrhage is present. Also here, further standardization is needed um, between the institutions. When we see it from the map, um, you are in a patient with, a, as an example, different example. Um, so we see high permeability shown here um, in tumor growth and in recurrence. This, was, this method was addressed in a paper um, with mel metastatic melanoma, where they found clearly a progression with elevated P and K trans in the upper row and a, um, a pseudo progression in lower corresponding BP and K trans in the lower row. Also, the discriminator um, um, was rock curves here for DCI versus lesion volume, where these K trans and uh, and relative K-trans and relative uh, VP were better discriminators um, uh, for lesion um, in determining tumor progression. And also here, I uh, need to show you um, the fat uh, pet combination with um, 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 MRI and uh, immunotherapy. We see a patient under immunotherapy, which uh, was suspicious um, of um, pseudoprogression. There was no uptake, but in the second patient, we had a baseline where the MR, here's a, the a colleagues at the patient, where the MR was suggestive of pseudoprogression. They waited, and then there was from the IRAN criteria, a clear MR progression, but in the pet pet not. So that, that is a very good tool. So now we are at true progression. Uh, we have um, some true progression and I want to address true progression. Um, as um, immune therapy was introduced, there were some observations made that a little bit later than the pseudo progression time there were, uh, were some is, uh, can be seen that there are contrast enhancement in remote areas of the tumor also in another um, patient and these regress so this was mm, of course 
a little bit alarming, but we, um, the authors here addressed firstly that there needs to be a change in follow up or decision making. Um, RANU was not enough anymore in these patients because every new lesion in a patient uh, would have been a progression. So um, there was um, this um, Lancet paper, which I um, will um, just a little bit summarize here, where we have the decision making tree and where from the radiology point of view, is, it's, it's um, important to know that after the suspicion is made, we have um, this decision tree clinically, um, this decisions of course made. And um, when, um, um, when there is um, the duration of immune therapy is also important uh, over six months, more than six months, and you need a sec second scan after, uh, next scan after three months, just to confirm if it's progression or if it's not progression. And um, these progression decision is made from the old, so to speak, old RANO criteria. And, um, and then it goes on and on. Um, if it's progression, then um, the patient is progression. If not, there needs to be a, re a repeat scan after three months and so on. So I would like to make a very short summary. So conventional MR is still the workhorse at 1.5 T, better use 3 T, of course. Um, advanced MRI techniques are available like perfusion and cest. And there's much work to do, to be honest, and I've shown you this hopefully. And FedBed in combination with MRI is offering very promising results. And we use it in our institution in cases where Things are not so clear quite often. That needs to be said honestly also. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, and now we have to fight ourselves through the chat. <laughs> um, there's actually quite a bit of discussion ongoing. So I try to go back. Um, Andrea, I don't know whether you see it, but I read it for you anyway. So the first question, I think that's one of the easy ones. Is it a real observation that colon brain meds are usually at the level of the posterior cranial fossa? No, I've shown you one example where it was not, and I would not say this, no. I think it's in all textbooks, but probably the textbooks are from a time when we didn't know what else to do. Yeah. So I've, I've shown you one example of a, of a colon um, carcinoma metastasis, and um, and for my um, for my knowledge, it's not uh, not like that. Yeah. So um, then um, we come to a, a long comment, and I will just quickly read it for you anyway. Um, should we consider pseudoprogression and radionecrosis two different entities with different evolution as well? And then the colleague criticizes, I think, rightly that the terms are not adequately used. And um, I think then we have a discussion. So maybe to, to cut that a bit together, do you think these are radiological terms or histological terms? And who should define <laughs> what these terms are? For, for which discipline is that to define? So I know that, of course, that they are um, clinically and radiologically um, not uh, um, always overlapping uh, ideas about that. I have, um, my task here was <laughs> to show you the radiological side. And I think um, because we can uh, go as deeply into much more deeply into this, but I think there needs to be a consensus uh, meeting about that. Um, so radionecrosis is normally uh, later pseudo progression is earlier after radiation therapy and i've shown you the details of each in, in my talk um so um there's one uh, suggestion and you can comment on that i guess it's a discussion between nikki and rachke and giuseppe miniti is is radionecrosis damage to the normal brain and progression refers to the tumor is the word that simple <laughs> So um, as, I, as I showed you, um, um, the pseudo 
um, pseudo progression shows um, shows a little bit of increase after the radiation therapy of the tumor, and you could say this, but I'm I'm not so sure if we if we are allowed to answer this question from the radiology side. It should be underlined by histology. And then I have to pick uh, some of the questions. Uh, one that I also like is. Um, what about very small post-therapeutic lesions, millimeter range that pop up during the course of disease, probably mostly post-radiation, I would guess. Any tools to interpret these small lesions or simply early follow-up? Yeah, um, I, I know what uh, this uh, commentator is talking about, and this is, uh, can be a really, really challenging. And I normally, when they are very, very small, and maybe faint, and also when there are some vessels in the knee of it, I, I prefer to say suspicious, and then do um, a proper um, repeat MRI one, one, one and a half months later, for example, to be really sure if it's growing or if it's just like, sometimes you can see from the hemodynamic of contrast injection differences, sometimes um, other, uh, as I said, vascular things can happen, uh, as I have seen in follow-up of metastasis uh, patients, also in um, immunotherapy patients, um, then they um, regress normally. Um, so I think I've worked myself through the chat. I have a maybe a final question, of course, acknowledging that you are not allowed to talk about nuclear medicine too much, but still, um, when we use that for radiation necrosis, of course, we also have um, blood-brain barrier disruption. And it is my, my feeling that we are that the PET is not so useful in these horrible lesions because it's not so easy to, to really distinguish what we are seeing. So if you compare advanced MRI with PET, with amino acids, who do you think is gonna survive to tell us what progression and what uh, pseudoprogression is? Hmm. No, I will not answer this uh, <laughs> because uh, all the papers say that it's the combination uh, of MRI, um, meaning perfusion MRI and, um, um, and PET, because we, we um, examine different, different things we, uh, with uh, different uh, cellular vascular things with, uh, with these both methods. So, I think it will be a combination and maybe we find other imaging tools like CEST that um, may be better in, in the follow-up, we don't know. Thank you. I see no further questions. 17.32, we're good in time. Thank you very much. Uh, Andrea, see you later today. And we now um, come to the next talk um, that's gonna be given by um, Anna Berkov from Vienna. Vienna is a very, very close ally for us in the brain metastasis field with Anna Berkov and Matthias Preusser for a very long time. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot be here today, Anna, but thanks for joining and you're going to tell us about advances in systemic therapy, novel immunological treatment options. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to be here at least virtually, um, and as I just noticed that the, the virtual format is not uh, anyhow decreasing the chat activity and the discussion activity, so uh, please all feel free to put your um, questions in the discussion, and um, I will try to make my talk very precise so that we have some time for discussion because that is what this topic is really about. So I will talk about immunological treatment options in brain metastasis and at fully disclosure, besides my real disclosures, that this is an obstacle and that there is a lot to do and that we still have a lot to do um, in this field. So starting off a little bit with the background, you all know the cancer immune cycle. So we have antigen release from the tumor. It has to travel to the lymph node. In the lymph node, the T cells have to be activated and then they travel back to the local um, tumor. And certainly this complex interaction is somehow challenged in brain metastasis. It is something different than glioma. So um, it's not the same challenges like glioma, but nevertheless, um, we always have to acknowledge that um, activating the immune system in the brain is always somehow challenging. 
and that the immune system is differently regulated in the brain compared to the other parts of the of the body to prevent that the brain gets too much damage by um, autoimmunological um, mechanisms. So first of all, we do have tumor infiltrating lymphocy uh, lymphocytes in our brain metastasis, and this is the absolute um, um, precondition to have an active immune system and have some um, response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And you see here in this picture, these brown spots are all T cells, so they are very dense. And we see um, almost in every brain med that we uh, looked at here in over 100 samples, we saw at least some of these tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So um, that there is no immune system is definitely not something that is true but there is an immune response in brain meds. And what we also know is that these patients are doing better. So the more inflammation you have in your tumor and also in your brain med, the better is the prognosis. So logical consequence would be that we target that therapeutically and that we use these tools um, to actually target the tumor cells. However, while in general oncology, um, um, immune therapy is really widely established and not a discuss discussion at all, we are somehow a little bit um, lacking evidence in neuro-oncology because brain-med patients were so frequently excluded from the first trials. I brought you today some um, evidence, but nevertheless, we really have to acknowledge that the big studies, the studies including hundreds and hundreds of patients, um, for the registration trials that these trials excluded brain med patients. And so we have in a lot of different entities still very, very little evidence. So these are um, a short overview on the most um, uh, studies that included brain med patients that were either brain med specific trials. Um, and then we also have some trials that I will show you later on that had brain metastatic specific endpoints. But these are the studies that were really designed to ask questions on immunotherapy in brain meds. And what you see here on first, first side is that we have most evidence in melanoma. Um, in melanoma, um, immune checkpoint inhibitors are the established first line treatment. And the melanoma field was really early on very much involved to do brain metastasis, brain metastasis specific trials. Well, other entities, like for example here, pembrolizumab um, in, in non-small cell lung cancer is somehow lacking back. Um, I don't know what is the reason for that and why, for example, the lung cancer field or also nowadays the triple negative uh, breast cancer field is not so much involving that like the melanoma field because the incidence is even higher or maybe even more pressing, but nevertheless, we have here really a lack of evidence, unfortunately. What is the good question from the trials that we already have is that we don't see any increase in neurological symptoms. And I think that is basically um, the baseline to say, okay, we're exploring that now further. Um, because there was a huge um, uh, fear in the beginning that certainly brain metastasis are associated with more pseudo progression that really uh, uh, causes neurological symptoms or that brain meds even cause more neurological side effects, for example, in Gillian Barre or something like that. But all that was not um, shown to be true in these um, so far early trials, but also in larger registration trials now that we don't have here an increase in neurological symptoms. This is certainly so far the largest study um, on um, immune checkpoint inhibitors and brain metastasis, and also one of the highlights published in, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and what was here done is the combination of an, in, in, uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab in newly diagnosed melanoma brain metastasis, and that is the standard treatment in this disease. So newly diagnosed melanoma in the metastatic field uh, in the metastatic setting gets first line ipilimumab and nivolumab, and that was explored here. What was special in this um, study is that only patients with A to oligosymptomatic melanoma brain metastasis were included. And here starts one of the big discussions about immune checkpoint inhibitors in uh, brain meds, what is actually asymptomatic. So um, the authors here said, okay, patients were um, screened for brain metastasis, and if they were found to have brain metastasis, but no correlated neurological symptoms, they were called 
uh, to oligosymptomatic and were included in this trial if they don't had any need for steroid treatment. But nevertheless, it is a little bit discussion. Um, what is the symptom and can we include here all patients? Do we have to include the area where the brain mat um, is, is happening? Um, so there are some, some points still on, on discussion. Um, further, it was um, a single arm uh, study. So it was not a comparative arm, it was a phase two single arm. Um, but what the um, authors could show that is that we have here quite um, a promising response rate. Um, so this is the um, intracranial and the extracranial uh, um, progression-free survival. And you see they're very, very close together. So it's if you have a um, response extracranially, your chance to have a response intracranially is very high. And we have here at 12 months, over 50% of the patients still responding to this therapy. And this can be considered a very, very active um, therapy in this um, disease entity. What is now with patients that are pre-treated? Um, and this is always a discussion. So um, a lot of the discussion is going, should we do um, immune checkpoint inhibitors first and then radiate, or should we do radiation first and then immune checkpoint inhibitors? And there will be a large session tomorrow um, just concentrating on these questions in the three big entities, melanoma, lung cancer, and breast cancer. Uh, I'm really looking forward to these sessions. However, um, you will probably see this slide tomorrow in the discussion again, because in this study, um, we had three different cohorts that is also led by the Australian group, group um, from Georgina Long. And what is really interesting in this study is not so much that ipilimumab and nivolumab in combination is more effective than nivolumab, what you see here with these bars, but the comparison of cohort B and C because the difference between cohort B and C is that cohort B is actually patients with asymptomatic, newly diagnosed brain metastasis, and the cohort C are recurrent brain metastasis that received local treatment before. And if you compare here the um, response rate, you see that the extracranial response rate um, in these all through small, but in these groups um, is pretty much the same. So, if you have recurrent or not recurrent brain meds doesn't um, somehow impact your extracranial response. However, what you see is here, the bar for the intracranial response rate is much higher here in the cohort B than in the cohort C. So the recurrent patients have a much lower um, response to nivolumab monotherapy compared to the intracranial uh, response in the cohort B, the asymptomatic newly diagnosed patients. So we have to ask ourselves, is maybe immunotherapy more effective in newly diagnosed, so far not treated brain metastasis. Um, here you have a little bit an overview on the immunotherapy um, data that we have so far in brain metastasis. And you see here um, the ipilimumab combination trial that I just showed you um, the data from, and we also have here some data from um, non-small cell lung cancer. And you, really see here that the non-small cell lung cancer is much worse. Um, so here the response rates are by far not um, as promising as it is for melanoma. Um, but I think that a little bit here, the, the cause is that these were not um, brain metastasis specific trials, that a lot of these were pre-treated. You see that here that we're all pre-treated brain mats and we just saw the data from melanoma. So it could be that in pre-treated brain metastasis, we don't have such high response rates. And I think really for the non-small cell lung cancer part, we need properly um, uh, designed prospective trials because this one pembrolizumab trial only included like 16 patients. Um, and I think it's really hard to draw conclusions from that compared to this trial that at least um, um, included um, over 90 patients. So the big discussion is, and we will talk about that tomorrow a lot, is which patients should receive immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment first, um, and for which patients um, you should uh, sequence the treatment, and how effective is here, um, that especially in the, in the context of immune checkpoint inhibitors. So we have, on the one hand, some clinical trials that showed us that in the first line, treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors can be very effective. Um, 
um, for melanoma and a little bit also for lung cancer. But the big question is, is that true for other entities? And we really have very, very little evidence, for example, for immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment in renal cell carcinoma or gastric cancer. And these are all entities where immune checkpoint inhibitors are licensed and that all for rarely, but nevertheless can produce brain meds, but we don't have any idea here yet on the intracranial activity. Um, for renal cell carcinoma, I have correct myself, there is some small evidence um, from some um, post hoc analysis, but not like the like um, the evidence that we have in melanoma. And also for um, the treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors, we always have to ask ourselves in which setting do we actually have evidence for an intracranial response? That is totally excluded from the extracranial response. Extracranial response was shown in several studies, also in a further advanced setting, but based on the, on the data before from non-small cell lung cancer and from melanoma, in a brain med recurrence setting, we can only expect very little evidence of immune checkpoint inhibitors, while we have larger evidence um, that in a frontline setting, we have more um, capacity of the immune checkpoint inhibitors and a greater um, tumor shrinkage here. Um, and also the combination um, is a huge discussion. So should we actually um, combine with radio uh, surgery? Is that something how we enhance the activity of immune checkpoint inhibitors? And that is maybe that is also the way to enhance the activity in the recurrent setting. Because there is this episcopal effect, and um, a lot of you are maybe already heard of that, that in theory, if you um, radiate one lesion, you might create a larger response to immune checkpoint inhibitors as by radiating this one lesion, there is cell death, and then you release neoantigens, and this boosts um, the response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And this is a strategy that would be very, very nice in brain meds. Um, and there was quite some data. Um, in the retrospective setting, um, already um, focusing on that. But I think we really have to address here that this is retrospective data and that in res retrospective data, we always have this um, inclusion bias and um, also some more bias that we have to address and that what we need to do proper treatment regimens is prospective data, ideally on brain metastatic specific trials, but at least with brain metastatic specific endpoints. So I want to just um, on that topic um, shortly show you some um, uh, data from, from our lab where we actually looked on brain metastasis um, from non-small cell lung cancer. And this was a small cohort, totally acknowledging that. But these were patients that had a brain met re resected. Um, and then in the time between had some kind of treatment that you see listed here. And then a second brain met was um, resected because this local um, recurrence was progressing on the applied therapy. And if we now follow the idea that radiation is inducing a lot our capacity for um, immune checkpoint inhibitors, we would um, expect that the, these patients that received here some kind of treatment have here an increase in the PDL1 density or at least an um, increase here in the PDL1 expression. However, all through very little patient numbers, we see a very diverse situation here. And we only had two patients that actually showed here an increase and one received chemotherapy and one SRS. And same holds true here for pdl one expression, also no clear cut um, 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 direction here. Um, and all through this is a, is a small um, uh, study only. I want to tease you a little bit um, and announced that we um, worked further on this. So what are actually um, the immunological impacts of radiotherapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy in brain med patients and looked on a larger cohort of patients that were actually um, resected after one of these treatments. Um, and um, our great student, Ariane Steinl will present this data in the upcoming ESMO. And all through, I cannot uh, tell you now the results. Um, I can, I can announce it here and say, um, look at that. I think that will be very interesting in terms of um, how to apply immunotherapy in brain metastasis patients and how to plan maybe future um, combinations with radiotherapy. So what we really need are studies like this. Um, this is also led by the 
um, Australian group by Georgina Long. Um, and they ask themselves, what is that? Do we really need the addition of SRS or is um, the combination of EP and NIVO enough? Um, so it's randomized and it's again asymptomatic treatment naive melanoma patients, quite a high number. Um, and they're randomized. Um, from what I know, they started uh, randomization, but I'm not sure from one the, tr um, the results will be expected. But I think um, this is the way to go. And now, since all this work was done for melanoma and we're really reaching more and more evidence for immune checkpoint inhibitors in melanoma, I think it's really important to do the same work for uh, non small cell lung cancer and also triple uh, negative breast cancer. Um, what is a little bit um, the good um, the good information in the end is we looked on uh, looked in our data um, how our patients are going if they are treated with immunotherapy or target therapy and we have here an increasing fraction of patients um, over the last decade so that is something that is nowadays really um, standard and what is maybe even better is that we really impact the survival of these patients by applying um, targeted um, therapies and also immune therapies. And the immunotherapy um, curve here in green is still very much overlapping, but what is maybe a little bit promising that there is this plateau coming up and that we really hope that um, also in brain med patients we can achieve with um, immune checkpoint inhibitors the stabilization of the disease and turning it actually in a chronic disease that is, can be then stable over years. Um, and just to point that out once more, how effective immune um, checkpoint inhibitors can be, um, I put here um, the, the curve of the Sperduto GPA classification for melanoma, and here the data from, from the um, trial on the EP-NIVO combination that I, I just extensively discussed with you. And you have to admit that this year is progression-free survival and this year is overall survival. And certainly these patients here are the really good ones. So they are not having um, symptoms, um, they're newly diagnosed. So they're really, really, the really, really good um, selected patients. So um, all probably here in the GPA um, class one or even better. But nevertheless, what you see here is that at 12 months, almost, half of the patients already um, have died from the disease and at 24 months, it's only about 30%. And here in the curve um, at the same time point with 12 months, we have um, over 50% of the patients still responding to the therapy and not even have received any kind of local therapy yet that we spared in these patients because they were treated uh, frontline only with um, immunotherapy. And I think this, this um, 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 uh, this shows you um, that immunotherapy is really changing a lot um, the prognosis um, of these patients and this is also really valid in brain um, meds patient. Um, one smile idea at the end, um, is that not prevention? Um, and I want to bring that up because um, prevention of brain meds is I think always something that we have to ask ourselves. Um, treatment is so diverse um, that we have whole conferences covering the treatment of brain meds. So should we not actually prevent them? Would that not be easier? Um, and um, it was really great for me to see as an oncologist that um, here in this Durba trial, they actually included this as a question. So in this trial of non-small cell lung cancer, um, actually in a curative setting in the stage three, they combined um, radio um, chemotherapy uh, with devulumab, what is an um, PD-1 antibody. And they ask themselves, can we actually heal more patients, cure more patients from their non-small cell lung cancer? And it was a positive trial. So more patients actually are cured by the combination um, with uh, Durba. And what was maybe even more intriguing um, that the level of um, that the site of new lesions in the brain were um, cut by half. So that this, by applying this, immuno uh, this immunotherapy after chemo radiation, we could actually prevent brain metastasis um, and thereby um, improve the survival of these patients. So in summary, immune checkpoints um, are really active in brain meds. We need more data and we always have to consider some obstacles. Um, and what is really, I think the point is that it is way more effective in patients that are asymptomatic um, from what we know now. Um, here a little bit the, the good um, 
info is um, that we have an increasing fraction of patients that are actually diagnosed in an asymptomatic pattern over the last years because we screen more. So we also have these patients that is not an artificial um, cohort of patients. But, and that is definitely the take home message from my side is we need more trials, we need more evidence. Um, and I think it's really hard to, at the point now to say what is the ideal sequencing, what is the ideal role and what is the ideal time point for um, immune checkpoint inhibitors in the brain med treatment. With this, I thank you for the attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, um, Anna. Um, at the moment, there are one of the questions are coming in. Um, so the first one, I guess we had that before and we will have it tomorrow. Is there any timing from administration and start of radiosurgery in patients treated with checkpoint inhibition? Um, no, I think there is no data. Um, we looked on the timing in, in, this ESMO, in this project that will be presented at ESMO. So um, how um, long is the time from radi radiation and what is the, um, um, the density of tills? So we, we looked at that. So for what is the, the days in between? Um, and you, I can, you can see it there, but I can, can't tell you today. Um, then the question is, how do you handle dexamethasone in these patients? <laughs> I think dexamethasone is always as little as possible, right? So that is uh, irrespective of, of immune checkpoint inhibitors, you should always try to give as little de dexamethasone as needed. Uh, and if you need it, you have to give it. So um, that is basically my answer. What I do um, sometimes do in, in lung cancer patients is the combination with bevacizumab. So if I have a patient that is really steroid refractive, um, there is a combination of atezolizumab and bevacizumab that is um, licensed in non-small cell lung cancer in combination with chemotherapy. And this could be a schema that you apply here, but you have to admit this is highly experimental and there is no evidence that this is more effective or less effective. Um, then the next one, and I guess you see that as well, uh, Giuseppe Miniti is teasing you a bit with the uh, long-term data that from yeah. Tauri. Um, the response rate in symptomatic patients, 22%, um, um, a lot of patients with disease progression. So he asked, should we continue to exclude all symptomatic patients or patients on steroids? I guess he means from checkpoint inhibition. <laughs> Um, I think, um, so what I, uh, what I showed is that there is quite a lot of data in this, um, uh, in addition that I did not have in the presentation yet, is that pay, the, the baseline message is if you have recurrent brain meds and if you're on steroids, you have less um, response. I think what is always here, the question is what is our alternative and what is our treatment goal here in the brain meds? Is it the brain med or is it the extracranial disease? And in most patients, actually, we're giving the immune checkpoint inhibitors to control the extracranial disease, and they receive a local treatment in the brain. Um, so in, these patients should not be excluded. But I think what we have to admit is that we don't have any evidence, and we should not do that to do an immune checkpoint inhibitor monotherapy in symptomatic patients um, that are in need of a symptomatic relief. That is, that is something that we should not do. And the next one, that's an easy one, uh, after the guidelines, should we treat with ipinevo also patients with the rough mutant brain meds? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, good question and good discussion. Um, um, so I think this is also referring to, to what is the, the symptomatic burden, I have to admit. So I think also be rough mutated patients, if they're asymptomatic, have um, for their extracranial disease, a right to uh, at least receive um, immunotherapy. Um, and you could discuss that here, but we have to totally admit that the BRAF mutation and the BRAF inhibition is much more effective intracranially in these patients. So you have much more tumor shrinkage, especially if they're symptomatic. 
But Anna, our friends from the melanoma front have clearly told us in the guidelines that they want epinevo for everybody and they somehow yeah. have skipped the BRAF inhibitors um, and yeah, we so, followed them, right? Yeah, so um, I have to admit that in clinical practice, I would see that um, challenging um, and I always address that. I think, um, especially in terms of systemic treatment, we always have to address that there is no one size fits all in brain med patients. But a symptomatic patient or a patient that has brain meds in eloquent areas is something different than a patient with one asymptomatic brain med um, that, is, that is just in, in clinical practice, I think something different. So yeah, I understand the melanoma people, but I think if we're talking here in an expert round, especially on brain meds, I think you have to acknowledge that sometimes the situation is a little bit diverse. Okay, so with the Rainer Dummer is not here at the moment, or if he's there, he should defend his position, but he probably cannot talk because he's mutant, um, mutated, not mutant. So, <laughs> <laughs> or both. Last question, maybe that's actually a question for tomorrow, but you can quickly address it. Uh, what's your opinion um, for chemo plus immunotherapy in non small cell brain metastasis patients? Is it better than uh, immunotherapy alone? Great question. Um, and I think here it really, really needs more evidence. And I'm really desperately waiting for that because there is no good evidence for that question out there yet. Because in the combination trial, asymptomatic um, or symptom brain meds were excluded. Um, here, I think it's also important to address what are you targeting for? Is that the extracranial disease or the intracranial disease? Um, for the extracranial disease, we know that the combination is more effective, especially if you don't have a lot of PDL1. For the intracranial situation, I think you have to see what, what is the symptomatic burden. But I think, especially in non small cell lung cancer, so far there is very little evidence out there for um, um, a systemic monotherapy without radiation. Thank you. We're one minute over time, but I see that Rainer Tumor has raised his hand, but I'm not technically. <laughs> Capable yeah. of allowing you to talk. Yes, can can you you can you hear me? Oh yeah, yes. super. Right very out. good, very good. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, uh, it's between the lines. So the the recommendation is ipinivo if there is anything speaking against it. And one point is always the the corticosteroids. So uh, patients with high tumor load in the CNS typically are on corticosteroids. And then we recommend to go for the BRAF inhibitors, but we encourage uh, the physicians to retry later on when the tumor bulk is, is lower in the CNS to go back to immunotherapy. So it's not true that we always are against this, but principle first try immunotherapy, but debulking with uh, kinase inhibitors is recommended in many patients that are on corticosteroids. I think then we're perfectly aligned in our statement. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, the Pope has spoken. Thank you, Rainer, for being with us. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Super. So, um, yeah, Matthias is also happy. Here. Now you get all your red roses in the chat, but I'm, I go on mute now, and Matthias Guckenberger will take over for the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much, um, Anna, and say hello to our friends in Vienna. I'll do so. Bye. Okay, now we switch gears again. Um, we are going to switch back to local therapies. We've discussed imaging and we talked about systemic therapy. And then we have invited two colleagues talking about surgery and radiation. But then um, we have decided not to go in either or, or is it better to perform surgery or radiation? We decided how um, to best combine radiation and um, neurosurgery in, let's say, complicated patients. So let's start with a poll. I hope you can see it. Um, I can read the question. What treatment do you propose to an oligosymptomatic patient in good performance status, stable extracranial metastatic, non-driving mutated, non-small cell lung cancer with a 3.2 centimeter large cystic solitary brain metastasis developed under first-line chemo and IO? Would you recommend upfront neurosurgical resection followed by observation, upfront radiosurgery, followed by neurosurgical resection or upfront SRS followed by observation. So please vote. We have 20 answers in. 30, so let's give it 10 more seconds.
I'm missing the option up from surgery followed by SRS. Is that missing? Oh, that is correct. That mm. would, my yeah, that would be much, kind of, kind of should have been there, I have to admit. Um, so we have to stop. So it's not really what we expected for us because one answer was not there. So there was a preference for resection first and um, a large, less smaller proportion opting to start with um, the radiation approach. Um, that is what we will discuss now in the next talk, and it's a pleasure to announce the first speaker, um, a very long friend of mine, Professor Arjun Zagal. He's Professor for Radiation Oncology at the University of Toronto. He's um, Deputy Chief of the Radiation Oncology Department in Sunnybrook, and he's also Program Director for Cancer Ablation Therapy and the CNS Lead. Um, we've not invited him for these titles. We've invited him because he's an excellent researcher and even better presenter. He has just recently published a randomized trial on oligone on spine metastasis. Um, so he's one of the leading radiation oncologists in the field of CNS. Arjun, many, many thanks for joining and we're looking forward to your talk. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Matthias, and thank you very much. I'm just going to share my slides here. Okay, oops, sorry. Uh, end slideshow. I'm going to share screen. Okay. Okay. Do you have, uh, you can see my slides now? Mateus, okay? Yeah. All fine. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So it really is a great pleasure to uh, be here to talk to you all. And it's a controversial subject. And as a radiation oncologist, it's funny that I'm discussing the preoperative radiosurgery uh, because most of the time, this is something what our surgeons are pushing us to. And as radiation oncologists, we've been more comfortable with the post-op. But I certainly do believe in a lot of merits associated with preoperative radiosurgery. Just my disclosures. Now, this is the type of situation that Matthias uh, uh, describes. Solitary lesion has a big cystic solid mass in the posterior fossa pushing the fourth ventricle. And this is a situation where preoperatively, this patient would be considered uh, for surgery. And you have surgery, and then following this, we're seeing the postoperative surgical cavity. And surgery, we have to understand, is indicated in particular for large brain metastases, regardless of the number, three to four centimeters or larger, if they're symptomatic with toxic edema or herniation, in particular, radio-resistant tumors like sarcoma and colon cancer in particular, hemorrhagic metastases, especially if they're symptomatic, and for tissue diagnosis. And that's very important when we talk about the solitary lesion. Now, in terms of what, how we've been practicing as radiation oncologists after this particular case, well, we had been giving patients whole brain radiation for years. And along came cavity radiosurgery or the, the evolution of such being hypofractionated stereotactic radiosurgery. And we started doing away with whole brain radiation as a reflexive treatment, just because the patient had a surgical procedure. And the question is whether or not this is right or wrong. Because in this situation, if this metastasis was one centimeter, we would not have sent the patient for surgery, We'd probably just do radiosurgery. But just because we operated, does that mean that we have to do whole brain? And the answer has evolved more or such that cavity radiosurgery really is a standard of care. And we'll talk about that evidence. But what has happened over time with surgery? And I think this is important because we, we often use radiosurgery and less so consider the merits of surgical resection unless the patient is in such an extreme uh, position. And what we've observed over time is that there's been an increase, and these are melanoma-specific uh, data, of the use of uh, advanced targeted therapies and immunotherapies, but also conformal radiation, a decline in whole brain radiation, which you can see here. But the surgical uh, bar here has really showed that everything has been pretty stable. So, you know, even though over all these decades, we really haven't been increasing the utilization of surgery. It's always been reserved for those traditional indications, which is interesting when I look at the trajectory of treatments in terms of brain-directed therapies. And there has been a survival advantage over the years 
with, with, with surgery being stable, you wonder whether or not if we increased also a powerful local tool like surgery into the treatment paradigm, could we actually improve survival even more? Certainly the reduction in the use of whole brain and increase in targeted therapies drives the survival advantage. So what were the data? So, so the field was quite stagnant uh, for a lot of years, whole brain radiation postoperatively, and Paul Brown's study came out looking at adjuvant whole brain radiation versus radiosurgery. So what we observed here, and you can see in this plot, is that you do better in terms of neurocognition with radiosurgery. So you have less or better cognitive deterioration-free survival. No surprise, but we had to do the study, even though we did it in intact lesions, just to prove the community that you're gonna do better neurocognitively. So that, that was not the thing that interested me. Now, when you looked at the baseline characteristics, they had a good splay of large versus small tumors, excellent surgery, primarily solitary lesions. Now, what was the concern here was that 12 months, the local control was 60% versus 80%. And that was a worrisome factor because if we are, say, maintaining or, or, or allowing for better cognitive preservation, but we have worse local control, that's a problem with the treatment because ultimately we need to control the lesion or the cavity. Now, the leptomeningeal disease rates were quite low, but this was not a rigorous study in the sense of the imaging uh, follow-up and central review to detect leptomeningeal disease. So we always have to be careful and read the details when we talk about um, LMD. And then came in the same issue, the MD Anderson study. So here they had very good single center surgical approach, a good baseline of small, medium or large uh, metastases. And what we observed was that with radio surgery, your local control is gonna be better than observation. So again, no surprise, but this may have been a surprise to the MD Anderson because they were really thinking that you didn't need radio surgery. But lo and behold, the data are the data, and you see that you do have the benefit. So what was interesting in this situation, and the way that they analyzed the data were based on preoperative diameter. So if your preoperative diameter was under two and a half centimeters, you saw actually good local control. But for larger tumors, you had not so great local control, no matter what arm, radio surgery or observation. And this is, again, a cause of concern, because it tells us that there's something going on here that we have to pay attention to because local control is an important outcome that we're trying to achieve in these patients. And it brings us to the principles of radiosurgery dosing. So cavities are not like intact lesions. They're not small, little spherical targets. They're complex and they're irregular and asymmetric. And as a result, if you look at the principles of radiosurgery dosing, which the two trials did abide by, for these large tumors, you're basically underdosing them. And you're in effect for some of the larger ones, giving a lower dose than you would biologically than whole brain radiation when you talk about three to four centimeter tumors. So if you're giving 12 gray or 15 gray, you may be better off giving whole brain. And that may be explaining some of the local control data. So, so does this paradigm actually hold true because you're treating a cavity? Well, it's the principle of the volume of normal tissue that you're irradiating that leads to radiation necrosis. And that's the downside of single fraction radiosurgery. So this is why when I started doing this practice, we started hypofractionating as I learned in San Francisco, and I never did single fraction radio surgery. I always hypofractionated, and we gave five fractions with a LINAC, very convenient, and we reported our outcomes uh, showing a one-year local control rate of 84%, symptomatic necrosis rate 6%. And so these are some data, these are high quality data, because they're mine, no, I'm just kidding, but also because we follow people very rigorously with the MRIs every two to three months. Like these are high quality data, but good local control for large targets. And, and so this is in contrast to the randomized data. And when you put our data together with several centers um, around the world, we're seeing this kind of excellent local control with hypofractionated radio surgery really bore out, okay? So we're seeing very good rates of local control at one year, two years, three years, better than the randomized study, but there's still a volume dependence. So big PTVs are gonna do a little bit worse than the larger, than the smaller PTVs. So we do have to be mindful of this and we actually still don't know how to optimally dose hyperfractionated radio surgery. So you could say, well, post-operative surgery is great. You know, this is the data. This is, is it as easy as it sounds? 
Well, I'll tell you, it's actually quite difficult. And think between the paradigm that's evolving of preoperative radio surgery. So here you have a nice round renal cell net, have surgery. Now look, lo and behold, you have this big cavity. You didn't have this before if you treated this patient pre-op or it's radio surgery alone, but now you got a four and a half centimeter cavity if you treated single fraction radio surgery, 12 gray suboptimal therapy. But lo and behold, you also saw some area of infarct and things are happening with surgery and there are changes and there are dynamic areas. And in this situation, I excluded that area of hemorrhage, although I was a little bit worried and you know, we really involve our neuroradiologist and we said, nope, that's infarct, take it off. Lo and behold, she did very well. We saw some weird post-operative changes, which we see in longer term survivors with this technique because we're really radiating the normal tissue and they set, tend to resolve. So, so it's not as easy to draw these cavities, to understand the neuroanatomy after surgery. And you can see some, some strange kind of longer term um, uh, imaging findings, which we still have not characterized really well. And this has led us to do a cavity consensus guideline. So at least you have a little bit of guidelines now in terms of how to draw these, and these have been adopted internationally. Now, there is a bit of clinical validation. This is always the issue with these guidelines, showing that if you did do that one centimeter dural margin, you may reduce the risk of local failure. And we talk about this meningeal margin, but that increases the volume irradiated. So again, a downside to postoperative radio surgery. Now, there's also this issue of what's happened to that cavity during radiation. And these are some data we have in submission because we were treating patients on the MR linac. So at day three out of the five, we were actually doing contrast and replanning. And what we saw is that we can see these reductions in the cavity called cavity dynamics during treatment. So they're not that stagnant. And if I didn't adapt the radiation plan, I'd be over treating the normal tissue, increasing the rate of radiation necrosis. So again, a potential downside to postoperative cavity radiation. Now, why this is important, because we showed the relationship between the volume of brain minus GTV or CTV irradiated for hypofraction radio surgery and radiation necrosis. So if you can keep reducing that volume irradiated below the threshold of 10 and a half cc's, you'll reduce the risk of radiation necrosis. Again, when you have a big postoperative cavity, this is hard to achieve this metric. Now, the other downside to surgery is inducing leptomeningeal disease, and it is becoming an iatrogenic complication. And we showed in these data between intact tumors and cavity cavities that they have a higher risk of dissemination. And so it's interesting that our surgeons now are actually consenting patients in the sense that the leptomeningeal dissemination may be a direct result of surgery. And if you've treated it already, maybe that reduces the risk because at least it's treated metastatic uh, cells as opposed to intact cells. And we showed that very nicely in the study. We also showed that some of these, um, we also showed some new agents may reduce this rate, but at the end of the day, the cavity rates of leptomeningeal are far greater than intact tumors. Now, why is this also so important? Well, because if you induce leptomeningeal disease, the patient dies and you impact their survival directly. So it's not just a, 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 it's a, it's a real complication with serious impact on patient survival. Some of these new agents may reduce that risk. We don't know yet. Then comes pre-op. So all these downsides led some early adopters to start doing preoperative radio surgery. And we saw in this study, although it's non-control data, the same local control, which makes sense, but less radiation necrosis because you're cutting it out and less leptomeningeal disease because you've treated the metastases. So these are provocative data. And this brings us to the advantages of preoperative radio surgery. So you don't have the issue of tumor delineation. You may reduce the risk of leptomeningeal disease and, and death of the patient. You may reducing the risk of radiation necrosis. Maybe better local control, we don't know. It's, you can do single fraction, so it's convenient. We don't delay post-surgical oncologic management because you got to remember they have surgery, so they may have waited for the surgery. Then you got to wait two to three weeks. Then you got to plan them. Then you got to treat them, and then they're going to go back onto chemo. Surgical cavities are more difficult to delineate and challenging, and that's may also lead to the worst rates of radiation necrosis and local control. And post-operative cavities tend to be much larger than anticipated. So ultimately. You know, there are some patients where you can utilize, where the utilization of surgery has to come first, but you're inducing leptomeningeal dissemination and anything we can do to reduce that complication is advantageous. 
But the disadvantages, and, um, and, and Mateus, let me know if we're doing okay for time. I just started out differently. I think we have a few minutes. The disadvantages are that we have to have the resources to organize this. So you got to get your team streamlined. You see the patient, get the preoperative radio surgery done, get them into the OR, because typically you're talking about 48 hours to surgery. We don't know that timeline. It's still a neurosurgical procedure without the risk of with risk of complications. So it's it's still a major issue that you're putting them through the operation in the first place. Now, this practice of de-escalating the dose because you're cutting out is controversial. So if I have a big tumor, but I know I'm cutting out, why can't I give 20 gray? Why do I have to give 12 gray? And we don't know that. So there's still a lot of work to do to define the optimal practice and prescription practice of radio surgery. And there's also the issue of uh, the role of preoperative hypofractionated radio surgery. And so that's evolving predominantly by the Duke group. Now, one of the other issues that's very important is tissue confirmation. So I'm very careful with solitary lesions. You have to be sure if it looks like it makes sense, then go ahead, but be careful of the patient who presents, you know, two years later, three years later with a solitary lesion and you think it's a met, well, it could be an abscess. So, so there's limited evidence. I think that's a disadvantage and it may lead to the overutilization of surgery as well, because you just think we're just doing radio surgery, then, then we're gonna do operation, but not everybody needs an operation. And this is where some of the more novel techniques in radiation, like hypofractionated radio surgery, are coming into play for larger tumors where you would otherwise operate. Well, here and behold, this patient did really well with hyperfractionation, and we couldn't even operate in this patient. And so you may not take advantages of these new approaches. And if we had a way to predict that patient, we could select patients better for surgery. And this is chemical exchange saturation or metabolic imaging, whereby we're able to stratify a responder versus non-responder based on the one week MRI. So you, you get a baseline, you get your one week post uh, MRI, you look at the metabolism and if it's bland, that person's going to go good, save the patient the operation. If it doesn't look like it's responding, operate. And this is where we need to come in. So advanced imaging is, is important. Radiomics is important. We've shown some abilities to protect, predict tumor response just based on the actual radiologic characteristics of the image and shown, shown this to be powerful. And we're working together with metabolic imaging to, to um, improve our abilities to predict response and to use surgery more effectively. And lastly, it's stage radio surgery. And this is really interesting. And I really love this in some patients. You give the patient eight gray, wait two weeks, let it go down, adapt the radiation plan, give another eight gray. And in some situations like re-irradiation this, I give four gray on the third. And the patient's done really well. And this is powerful for large tumors or critical tumors. So there's new ways to deliver radio surgery. It's not all just single fraction radio surgery. And there are non-radiosurgical means now to treat patients. So there's focused ultrasound where we're opening the blood-brain barrier, delivering the chemotherapy directly into the tumor, and then seeing response. So again, trying to save patients from radiation and surgery from that regard. And this is some interesting data with Herceptin and MR guided focused ultrasound that's accepted in science translational research. It's a program here at Slanderberg that we're expanding uh, continuously. So in conclusion, what I would say is that patients with brain metastasis are living longer. Surgical indications will always exist, but there will be a role for preoperative radio surgery. We need to improve with improved uh, radio surgery technology. We can overcome those resource barriers. And some patients will never be able to have preoperative SRS. They need surgery and then you have to do post-op and it is what it is. But leptomeningeal disease is not to be underscored. And with advanced imaging, I think we're going to get to a better better sense of who needs pre-op and who needs post-op in the future. And, and the future is still very wide open to treat these patients more effectively because it's something that will never go away in cancer patients. And with that, I look forward to my colleague Marion's um, uh, discussion on the other end, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Arjun, for an excellent overview and discussion. Um, maybe one question, then we continue. <clears throat> to the second talk and have questions afterwards. Um, there was one question about margins, Arjun. Um, what is your margin you're going to apply in the post-operative and the pre-operative session setting? So, so that's a good question. That's an excellent also uh, advantage of potential preoperative radio surgery is no margin. We treat it just like an intact, treat it, cut it out. You have to anticipate the surgical procedure being a gross total resection. The, the, 
and that's also another challenge, I think also, but we don't apply any margin. But for post-op, we put a PTV. For pre-op, it's single fraction, no PTV. Okay, I would propose that we continue um, with the second talk and then we have a joint discussion afterwards. It's a pleasure now to announce the last speaker for today. Um, Dr. Maya Neider, he's stellvertretender Chefarzt, Vice Chairman of the Department for Neurosurgery at the Canton Spital St. Gallen. He is also in affiliation here at the University Hospital of Zurich and has a long track record in the field of um, neuro-oncology and obviously in neurosurgery. Thanks, Marian, for joining our um, discussion here and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for your kind introduction and um, yeah, for inviting me to this fascinating meeting. I already learned um, a lot. I have no uh, financial conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, as we are uh, speaking here uh, about local therapies, I also want to give some um, uh, yeah, infos about advances on surgical technique and then cover also the topic of post-surgical radiotherapy as opposed to the newer concept of pre-surgical radiotherapy. And in the end, I will try to summarize what our role as surgeons in the management of brain med patients is right now and what it might be uh, in the future. I think when we talk about local control, one important um, conceptual difference that we always have to take in mind is the difference, the biological difference between gliomas and uh, brain metastases. Uh, gliomas are a systemic brain disease. They might look uh, localized on imaging, but you find actually tumor cells centimeters away, even on the other side of the brain. And that's here beautiful show, uh, beautifully shown in staining for the IDH1 mutation by uh, Felix Sam. In brain meds, it's a little different. You do also see a brain invasion, and I'm uh, showing data here from a previous speaker, Anna Berkop, who showed that there are different um, patterns of brain invasion, but in general, the brain invasion does not uh, reach the extent of gliomas, but it's usually less than one millimeter. So in theory, it is possible to locally cure a lesion, but of course, it's always uh, possible that if you see a single lesion that you already have um, metastasis below the threshold of imaging and uh, that you are not aware of the, of, the, of the time of local therapy. For surgery, um, one could think that the, the basic concept of a craniotomy and then removing tumor using the microscope um, hasn't really changed much uh, within the last decades. That's not really true because the reality is that there are a lot of upcoming techniques and technical devices that do help us a lot and that also improved or came up during the last couple of years and that are very important in reaching the goal of gross total resection, especially maximum safe resection. So to be very radical regarding tumor on one side and also safe regarding, um, yeah, avoiding damage to the normal brain. Here are just the most frequently used techniques like electrophysiolo electrophysiology, hydrogative neuromonitoring, awake surgery, navigation, that's absolutely standard since many years, ultrasound, fluorescence, not frequently used in brain metastasis, but also works in studies, and uh, the intraoperative uh, MRI. This shows basically what um, techniques we use for, for brain meds. So the workhorse uh, approach is certainly still craniotomy and then microsurgical tumor resection, but there are also upcoming techniques uh, which are less invasive, much smaller incisions, just using a small burr hole and at least of course to, to shorter um, surgery duration and faster recovery, faster wound healing and also faster uh, adjuvant treatment. This here, for example, is uh, a burr hole approach to superficial metastases, and you will see in a video how, how that is done. So it's basically a small skin incision, and then a burr hole, and burr hole is extended a bit with a punch. And then using the intraoperative ultrasound, you can confirm the correct location of your burr hole and of, you know, look at the lesion, that's a brain mat, which is very superficial here from, from the lung cancer patient, opening of the dura and the brain mat is taken out using microsurgical instruments and also the ultrasonic aspirator, which you see now. 
this resection is then controlled again using the intraoperative ultrasound. You can confirm that you took out the mass and also that you didn't create, for example, hematoma. And the whole thing is covered with a titanium plate for cosmetic control and closed in standard fashion. I also quickly want to introduce uh, therapy LIT, laser interstitial thermal uh, therapy. It's a local therapy option that, at least in Europe, is fairly new. And um, this is a concept video by the company. There are two companies actually that uh, sell these devices. One is approved in, in Europe, Medtronic, and the visualized system. And um, you basically plan preoperatively a trajectory and use a stereotactic frame, as you see here, with a step incision and really a tiny burr hole. And then you insert the laser catheter using stereotactic technique. And the actual treatment then occurs in the MR scanner. So the surgeon and the radiologist would be in the control room of the MR and basically watching the ablation of the lesion using um, heat imaging. So thermography or an MRI heat map where you can watch in real time how the lesion is uh, ablated. This is an, an example of uh, a lit case. That's a female patient with a non-small cell lung cancer brain metastasis that did undergo stereotactic radio surgery. And then uh, shortly after that, she had expansion of her mass and uh, severe edema formation, even on the steroids became symptomatic. And she underwent a laser ablation. And um, a few weeks after the laser ablation, you also saw expansion of the lesion, but already the edema was uh, shrinking. And a few months after that, you found the lesion to be uh, gone and also the edema. And um, the interesting thing about lit therapy is that it's not only useful um, in treating active tumor, but it's also a nice tool for treating radionecrosis. And this year is a, this data from, on, on lit in, in patients with brain meds from the group at Yale. And they compared lit to bevacizumab to avastin the treatment of, of radionecrosis and found improved overall survival in the lit group. Of course, you have to take this data with caution because there is for sure a very good uh, amount of selection bias. What it shows, however, and that's also shown by many other um, smaller series which do point in the same direction, is that lit is a very effective option in treating radionecrosis. The edema really shrinks very fast after treatment. And that's a very interesting option also in the setting of upcoming immunotherapies. If we have another tool to treat um, the edema that doesn't really interfere with immunotherapy or even is maybe helpful, that might be interesting, an interesting tool. And the other good thing about lid is that when you insert this catheter, you can obtain tissue. And as reported for intraoperative or for focused ultrasound, one thing about LID is also that it's believed to open up the peritumor blood brain barrier. And this is based on imaging data and also on data that looked at serum biomarkers here, neuron specific enolase. And um, the duration of this blood brain barrier opening is supposed to be four to six weeks with a peak around three weeks. And that, of course, is also a window of opportunity for combination with, uh, with systemic therapies or especially also with um, checkpoint inhibitors. And that's an example of an ongoing trial in which LIT is combined with Pembro in brain med patients. And it will be very interesting to see what that trial shows. Is any any meaningful signal? Uh, I think I will be short on the radiotherapy parts, um, but I also want to give my view on post-operative radiotherapy and uh, versus pre-op. Um, one has to acknowledge that the local control rate of just surgery, which is not followed up by, by radiation, is quite scary. It's 60% uh, of recurrence uh, without any radiation. And uh, 
the old classical prion lineage journal come, showed that uh, surgery and radiation is far superior to radiation alone. Of course, at that time, that is uh, whole blood, uh, whole brain radiotherapy. And uh, recent studies showed that uh, stereotactic radio surgery after surgery significantly reduces tumor bed recurrence and uh, also together with the data that whole brain radiotherapy has a, a strong negative impact on neurocognition. Now, um, surgical for, for resected lesions, post-operative uh, stereotactic radio surgery is considered the standard and uh, whole brain radiotherapy more or less uh, obsolete. Um, however, this new concept of applying um, stereotactic radiotherapy shortly before um, the planned surgical resection is for sure also from our perspective uh, very interesting. Um, as the previous talk by Dr. Dr. Sagal showed that the, the cavity planning for radiosurgeons is much easier apparently and uh, also this delay of treatment that you usually have. So you have patients that wait two to three weeks until they undergo radiotherapy because the, the wound has to heal up. But actually, it is also the case that for some patients, it might be even much longer because you will always have patients that might be also immunocompromised. They have a systemic disease. They might have un uh, undergone chemotherapy before and so on. So they're not the healthiest patients, at least some of them. And then you have also the problem of, of wound healing um, and if you have wound healing problems and then treatment gets delayed even longer. So for maybe a couple of weeks and of course that's, that's suboptimal. And uh, to my understanding, there's also a biological uh, reason for doing that. So the intact tumor that is not resected is very highly supplied by, by blood, very well oxygenated. And that's important for the formation of ionized oxygen species and the formation of free radicals, which cause DNA damage and part of the treatment effect of radiation. And uh, the opposite is after surgery, you usually have hypoxic areas, ischemic margins, and um, that's not helpful for radiotherapy. And that uh, might also be possible in addition to, to the, the cavity uh, argument that the previous uh, presentation beautifully showed is also that potentially the the radiation doses can be lowered due to this uh, biological effect and of course importantly there's the risk of tumor dissemination by the surgeon and this um, for to the leptomeningeal space but also for example uh, to the skin that's also not unheard of and uh, this is in theory reduced by preoperative uh, radio surgery there are some small or at least not randomized data, which um, were also shown previously. And I guess the, the summary is that local control rates are very, and overall survival is similar, but uh, you see less radiation necrosis and uh, leptomeningeal disease also less in uh, patients that undergo preoperative radio surgery. However, there is now um, randomized data coming up. So if you look on clinicaltrials.gov, I, I did find three studies that are ongoing and recruiting to the US and one in Canada. What's interesting, however, is they do all have different uh, primary outcomes. I guess that's uh, you would expect it, but uh, what is also different is with the timing. So in these early studies, it was usually uh, in a setup where um, radiation was performed in, in two to two, one to two days, so within 48 hours between radiation and then surgery. And that's a little bit different in these trials. So for example, in this trial, you have uh, an, a time of up to four weeks until surgery is performed um, after, after preoperative radio surgery. And I'm not so sure whether that's, um, well, that's a good um, uh, timing actually, because in theory, the majority of patients that we do perform surgery on, they, they are symptomatic, they have large lesions, and it's hard to, uh, to, to think that these patients can wait to uh, up to four weeks until they're actually treated. And uh, of course, that also means later steroid weaning. Um, and what's also important is, I think if this concept of 
preoperative radiotherapy uh, would become the standard of care, we would also have a lack of tissue, tissue not only for histology and for NGS panels, but also tissue for research, which is important. Uh, we get this from, from uh, our cases, usually in a treatment naive situation, of course, maybe previous systemic therapy, but for a lot of patients actually completely treatment naive, uh, brain metastasis tissue, and that's, uh, I think, uh, something very valuable also for, for developing future strategies against brain metastases. Another aspect that's important to remember is that when we talk about all about this, then we're usually talking about single lesions or at, at least few lesions. And um, a big challenge is um, patients with multiple brain metastases and for then the strategy and the guidelines are um, not clear at all. There's a large variety of, of management strategies, and at least for the radiosurgical part, there's an interesting article that I want to recommend, which um, shows how management is done in German-speaking countries, and it's interesting how that really differs between centers. Um, Another thing that I want to mention is if you have a patient that clearly has an indication for surgery, and I think, um, yeah, whether you, um, another option instead of discussing whether radio surgery should be performed right before or right after surgery would be for these patients, uh, at least that have drugable mutations, to um, have them undergo systemic therapy and withhold radio surgery. And also the other way around, of course, if the patient has radio surgery and then is for four weeks fine without any symptoms, uh, I don't see uh, the indication for surgery then on the other hand to be very strong. So it's also a good option to um, have them undergo systemic therapy and withhold surgery and until progression. These are the old classical indications for surgery. And I think they're um, becoming less important. Also these limitations up to three lesions or four, three to four lesions, lesions, they're very arbitrary. I think our role is really to take out these lesions that are improving, that are causing the neurological uh, symptoms. And um, also the reduction of edema is a very important job that we have as neurosurgeons and uh, confirmation of histology. Also importantly, there is a lot of data pointing at the fact that um, MGS data from, from brain metastases is very different from, from extracranial um, data. So if you look at driver mutations, you do find mutations that you don't find in extracranial lesions and also the other way around. If you find driving, driver mutations outside the brain, it's uh, very much possible that you don't find them in the brain meds. So there's a lot of importance to looking at the tissue and also tissue for research is important and also for pharmacokinetic studies. So with surgery, we have the window of opportunity to give patients study drugs, to give them medications before surgery, and then assess their level and also their, their target coverage in the tissue that we reset. I think that's also a very good um, reason for, for surgery. Another uh, thing is, upcoming techniques like lids and also local catheters to and reservoirs that might um, bring medications and or even cells to, to the niche of the central nervous system. And that will be interesting in the future. Things like convection enhanced delivery. And as a summary, the main role for surgery, in my opinion, is to enable further systemic therapy and the best local control rates up to date is uh, when surgery is combined with uh, stereotactic radio surgery. And that, of course, is always a, an important teamwork between our, our two disciplines. And um, I like the con uh, concept of preoperative radio surgery. I feel that uh, for those patients that truly need surgery, um, it might be um, not very feasible um, to, to the reasons mentioned before. And uh, it will be interesting to see what these randomized, uh, randomized trials uh, will show. Thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. We're slightly behind, but not much behind schedule. We have time for a few more questions. There's also a very active chat um, about dose volume constraints of radiosurgery. So one question to you, Arjun. If I understand the discussion correctly, 
in the pre-operative setting, what is kind of contributing to the risk? Is it the risk, or is it the dose delivered to a gross tumor, which is cut out, so you give single fraction anyhow, or is it the dose exposure or the dose spillage um, in the one or two millimeters um, beyond the macroscopic disease, which motivated Giuseppe to opt for a fractionated approach also in the preoperative setting? So the way I approach radiation necrosis, and it really kind of came out of our understanding between the cavity experience and the intact experience. What we observed was the rates of radiation necrosis were higher for intact tumors and cavities, even though the volume that we irradiate was lower. Because, you know, we've always asked ourselves a question, right? You have a one centimeter tumor, you treat with 18 grain, you've got necrosis and you had surgery. And like, why did that happen? The V12 was three cc's, right? Because it's a contribution of the factors within the tumor interplaying with the normal tissue that increase the risk of radiation necrosis. And that's why I think we saw that reduction, even though the PTV volumes were three times the size, we had less radiation necrosis. So I think the fact that you're doing pre-op and a high dose 18 gray, even though it's a 14, four centimeter tumor, the fact that you're cutting it out, you're reducing the risk of radiation necrosis. So I don't think it holds true. But what I was saying that, look, if I, if I anticipate that the surgeon's not gonna be able to get a gross total resection, let's say I know it's this surgeon versus that one, and <laughs> I know what that guy's gonna be able to do without the other, I'm just kidding. But and let's say I anticipate a bad location, then maybe I wanna hypofractionate because I'm getting more dose in there. And if there's a residual, at least I know that's treated more effectively. So I think there's just a lot more to understand. Another question about timing, Arjun. So how is your timing in the preoperative setting? How much time do you need to plan an SRS? I mean, these patients are symptomatic, so you can't wait for a week. So what is the time between patients sitting in your, in your office and um, patient receiving SRS? And when do you plan the surgical resection or your colleagues? So, so we're lucky in the sense that, you know, we have a gamma knife, it's all streamlined. I can basically see one one day, plan them the next day, treat them the next day, operate. And the, it's the operation that's the issue, not, not the radiation. So we don't have the constraint here. But I need my surgeon to operate within 48 hours because I'm just following the data. We just don't know, right? So it pushes the, the case to be done within 48 hours. And, and the downside, on the other hand, if you said, okay, well, I'm going to see them, I'm going to hypofractionate them as a week, and then the surgeon now, is, his, his OR list is changing for the week after, and then all of a sudden they forget or something, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen. And lo and behold, they get toxic edema, and they're in the emergency room because you hypofractionate a five centimeter tumor, anticipating they were going to come out, or even during the case during the week of fractionation. So the advantage of doing single fraction radio surgery, high dose and operate is you keep the actual workflow as smooth and tight as possible. Maybe a last question to you, Arjun. What dose parameter are you most concerned of in the treatment planning process? We have seen, we're talking about single fraction. Is it V21? Is it V18? Is it V10, V12? What is your most important planning optimization parameter? So for me, you know, single fraction radio surgery, I don't look at any of it. I don't look at V12, V10, V9. I know exactly what the dose is and I know what the risk of radiation necrosis is. It's hypofraction and radio surgery, I don't know. And that's where our dose limit right now for five fraction, which we do a lot of, and that's why I was asking just that because we're doing more three just out of convenience. But our data shows 10 and a half cc's from the brain minus GTV. And if we exceed, so I go for 32.5 and five. If I exceed the 10 and a half, I drop down to 30. And if I can't make it to 30, I go to 27 and a half. But we do not want to get 25 and five. We have some data coming out in the red journal that are showing the control rates for 25 and five are not good. So at least try and push it as hard as you can. And we use the, the constraint that, that's specific to our technique. High tech has constraints, but the 10 and a half cc's has been validated now by a second group. So we're not the only ones that found it. I have another question about the laser induced um, the lid therapy. Something which I don't understand. I mean, I understood that the lid induces a necrosis, and that's what why you apply to metastasis. How can you apply it at the very same time for radionecrosis? Or is it again this kind of mixture in terminology that it might have been kind of a pseudoprogression? And that is something one can treat. But treating a necrosis and adding more necrosis on top um, doesn't sound like um, I would say a very appealing concept to me. What, what is your hypothesis um, 
on the on the data you've shown? What is the biology behind it? So I don't know the exact molecular background, but it must be the different type of cell death of necrosis that you induce with applying heat opposed to radiation. Of course, it, it uh, sounds very uh, counterintuitive because you're treating necrosis by inducing necrosis. What I can tell you that it does work and it must be that the necrosis um, that is induced by radiation causes a larger amount of inflammation and maybe vascular permeability, edema, and opposed to heating up tissue and by uh, like destroying it with heat in short time. So basically the cells are basically, the, the proteins are denatured and uh, cells are rupturing and it's not, um, it's, it's a different, must be different biology, but I cannot tell you the details to be honest, but I can tell you that it's very effective against um, radiation necrosis induced edema. Would be very interesting to get a bit better insight into the kind of molecular or the biology functionality how that works. Yes. Okay. Also, looking on my on the time, it's now eighteen fifty. So I would um, like to wrap up the session. Um, thanks everyone for joining. It was an excellent meeting. Thanks to all speakers who have contributed. Did an excellent job. Also. Everyone, many thanks for contributing to the discussion. We had a very live and active chat. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to join tomorrow. We have a second day coming up by tomorrow. You can see the program. Have a good evening. Enjoy the evening. Stay healthy and hopefully seeing you soon physically. Bye, everyone. Silke, vielen Dank. Gerne, tschüss. Hat super funktioniert, ganz Schönen herzlichen Dank. Abend zusammen. Ja. Tschüss. Ciao. Um, so, Matthew? Wir haben ja 25 Minuten noch Zeit. 24. Ja, ja, du hast einen Meter mehr zu laufen, ich bin schneller da. Ich bin viel fitter als du. Ich war gerade auf dem Matterhorn. Wahrscheinlich stimmt sogar, das macht mich irgendwie bedrückt. Bis nachher. Dass ich auf dem Matterhorn war, oder was? Nein, dass du fitter bist als ich. Weiß ich nicht, aber ich, also bis gleich. Wir werden sehen, bis dass wir da sind. Tschüss, vielen Dank, Frau Uflacker. Hat alles super geklappt. Gerne, tschüss. Tschüss, Anna, wenn du noch da bist, hat wahrscheinlich vergessen, sich auszuloggen. <lacht>